Good morning, friends, and welcome. As we have gathered now on this Ascension Sunday, I invite you to bow your head with me as we pray. Gracious and living God, we give you thanks, O God, for this day on which we commemorate your being taken up into heaven. Lord, we ask that as you now rule over all creation, so may you rule, O God, in our hearts and in our lives. Write your word, O God, upon our hearts, change and transform us, that we may live as those who follow you. May I speak to you now in the name of the God who is Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, I want to share with you this morning some words from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, reading from verse 20 to 21. There Paul writes, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the age to come. On this day, congregations around the world pause to commemorate Christ's ascension, that is, the day when, in the presence of his disciples, he was carried up into heaven and covered by the clouds. And this is an important feast day. And I don't know if you realized it, friends, but in the church's liturgical calendar, the calendar of principal feasts lists Ascension Day as second only to Easter. And so we have Easter, we have Ascension, and then we have Pentecost. And so the Ascension has always been, throughout the history of the church, one of the core confessions of the Christian community. And so we affirm it week by week, Sunday by Sunday as we come for worship, and day by day as we come for morning prayer, we affirm Jesus' ascension in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus, we say, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so although we commemorate Jesus' ascension on this day, Ascension Day itself was actually this past Thursday, exactly 40 days after Easter. For scripture tells us that Jesus appeared to his disciples and he remained with them for a period of 40 days following his resurrection from the dead. Indeed, it was his resurrection body, that body that was shown to be revealed to be both physical, that is, material, and also spiritual. It is that resurrection body which was carried up into heaven in the sight of his disciples. And so it is important for us, I believe, to ask ourselves, why? Why was it so very important for the early Christians to emphasize this fact of Jesus' ascension? Why does it hold such a high priority in the church's liturgical calendar, as I've said, second only to Easter? I mean, isn't it enough to simply leave the focus where it was, on Jesus' resurrection from the dead? Can't we just leave it there? You see, friends, while Jesus' resurrection from the dead marked for us his vindication as the one who is the Son of God, the one who is the Son of Man, the one who is our Messiah, and his defeat over evil and over death. The ascension, on the other hand, marks his heavenly enthronement as King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who is king and ruler over all creation. And so he is not only vindicated, but he is also lifted up. He is also exalted to the place that is eternally his own, to the place of power at the right hand of the Father. There the risen and ascended Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. 
Now, for those of you who have been journeying along with us for the last few months in our guided study by N.T. Wright, the book of Revelation, you will appreciate that John, in this vision that he is privileged to receive, has given us, in the book of Revelation, a glimpse of God's heavenly throne room and of the coming of the Son of Man, John writes in chapter 1, coming with the clouds. And he tells us that it is the slaughtered lamb. It is this lion of the tribe of Judah. It is this root of Jesse, who is the only one who was found worthy to open the seals on the scroll held in the hands of the one who was seated on the throne. And as he opened these, this scroll, he begins, he unleashes God's final and definitive judgment upon all evil in the creation. And so the revelation to John is a reminder to us of at least two important things. Firstly, it is a reminder to us of the closeness of heaven and earth. And he right will say that heaven is simply God's sphere of operation right in the midst of of our world, God's sphere of operation. And secondly, this revelation of John is a reminder to us that the risen Christ has not abandoned his disciples. He has not left them often, but that he is in fact continuing to contain and to limit the power and the effect of evil in this world and in this creation. And he is making his judgment, his definitive judgment on all evil. He is making it manifest as he sets all things right. And so Jesus, friends, is the king of creation. All things, whether or not we acknowledge it, all things live under his rule. This one who was risen from the dead, this one who is carried up into heaven. All things live under his rule. And we need to make sure that we live as his human creatures, that we live in a way which reflects his rule, so that we may be found at the end of the age to be standing on the right side of history. You know, there are a vast number of people in this world, friends, who live as if life is merely what we can see with our eyes or touch with our hands or perceive with our senses. And so their goal in this life is simply to live life to its fullest, to acquire as many possessions as possible. And so there are many who strive after power, who strive after wealth, who strive after influence in this world, and they strive after these things as ends in themselves, as things to be held on to in and of themselves, as if having these things will somehow make them feel whole or make their lives feel more full or more complete. As I thought about today's scripture, I was reminded that the scripture readings over the past few weeks during morning prayer have reminded us of the futility of wealth and of the folly of clinging to wealth. The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 62 that though wealth increase, and of course we may add to this, though power increase or influence may increase, though these things increase, set not your heart upon it, he says. In other words, don't go after these things as if you are dependent upon them, as if they are God for you. Because if you do so, they will then become for you idols. And friends, let me tell you that it leads to a hollow existence. That's why the scriptures will remind us that those who worship them are like them. If you worship that which does not speak or does not hear, you become like that which does not speak and does not hear. And there are so many who have sought time and time again, friends, to just 
fill this deep void in their lives with things. Only to discover that after they spend their entire lives running after these things, after power and wealth and influence, that their lives are still somehow hollow. That their lives still feel incomplete. You know, if, if people were to look at your life, and I mean, this is a question for all of us, right? If, if people were to look at your life, played back perhaps as if on a big screen with there being no sound, if they were to look at your life in review, would they be able to tell from the way that you actually live, from the way that you interact with others, with what you did with your time, with what you did with your money, with what you did with your talents, would they be able to tell that Jesus was Lord and King of your life? Would they be able to tell? And friends, let me say this, that if you cannot answer with any integrity yes to this question, yes, they would be able to tell. If you cannot with integrity answer yes to this question, then let me say to you, friends, that today is the day when God is inviting you to turn to him as the ruler of your life, to acknowledge his lordship over your life. To acknowledge that he is not just ruler over all creation as we know that he is, but that he is the ruler of your life. Over all that you have, all that you are, all that you hope to be. Today is the day, friends, when God is inviting you. St. Augustine wrote, Lord, you have made us for yourselves, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. You have made us for yourselves, and our hearts are restless. We can't find peace until our hearts rest in you, the one for whom our hearts were made. And so the great mystery, indeed, the deep irony of Jesus' ascension is that his going away from us, that is, his being carried up into heaven, means that he is, in fact, imminently close to us, that he is the one who sticks closer than a brother, that he is so close that we often do not even perceive it. I mean, how else can you make sense of and understand that scripture which comes near the end of Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, the judgment of the nations. How else do you make sense of a scripture like that, where the sheep and the goat are those who are distinguished only on the basis of whether or not they welcomed and served this Christ, who was somehow present among them, yet no one was able to see him. No one was able to recognize him. Lord, when did we see you? Was their response. You see, Jesus, precisely because he has ascended into heaven, is closer to us than we often realize. Right in our midst. Jesus is the ruler of creation. And now is at work among us. Taking, friends, even the worst that evil has to dish out in this life and in this world. And making it work together for the good of those who love and serve him. So you and I are called, friends, simply to remain faithful to this risen one. Faithful to this ascended one, even until death. Living our lives in such a way that those around us will have no doubt in their minds. That he is truly the one who is king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus' disciples said to him, or rather, Jesus said to his disciples, he said to them, And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. You know, when a parent takes a child to daycare or to kindergarten, 
for the very first time, I think that the, the thing that most children perhaps fear the most is that they're being abandoned, that their parent is not going to come back, and that's why you have all the screaming at the gate when, the parent, when it's time for the parents to leave. But very soon that child learns that their parent has not, in fact, abandoned them, that they are indeed coming back. And then when they learn this, they, they're able to function with boldness and with more confidence in that circumstance and in their surroundings. They're able to deal with that momentary separation. Friends, Jesus has not abandoned us. And you know what scripture tells us, that he will return in the same way that we saw him go up. That he will come to judge the living and the dead. And so my prayer for us this day, friends, is that God may not only give us this grace, but that we may receive the grace that he gives us to live boldly, to live confidently in his service now, in this day, in our lives, today, such that when he returns, when he comes to us again, we may be glad to meet him and glad to welcome him as our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Friends, we give God thanks for this Ascension Day. We give God thanks for his Son, who now reigns over all.